today's Tuesday Times Roundtable. I'm Eric from the Global Learning Office, if you don't know that already, and I'm here to introduce one of the most strategically important new members of the FIU community, relatively new. Um, at FIU, we're very lucky to have our own on-site Peace Corps recruiter, Andrew Sullivan, or also known as Andy, um, joined FIU's University Career Services team. Uh, so he's located right upstairs here in GC um, in the Career Services office as our two uh, special guests that I see joining us in the back here, Matt and Darren, uh, here to help you, you know, get all the internships and jobs and, and career preparation that, that you need. Do not leave this university without visiting that office. I'll be very upset. Um, Andy is a returned Peace Corps volunteer where he served in the Dominican Republic from March 2011 to June 2014. As a Peace Corps volunteer, Andrew worked with the women's group to develop a clean cook stove project, improving the health outlook and environment of the community. In December of 2013, he was selected as a Peace Corps volunteer leader for the environmental sector and extended his Peace Corps service for a third year, supporting volunteers and coordinating national projects. Um, and so just to touch on Andy's availability, because I did mention his office is upstairs, uh, this is a resource to you. Andy has office hours Tuesdays, uh, uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and uh, you, you can meet with him about um, applying for the Peace Corps, learning more about, about the Peace Corps, and he works very closely with our Peace Corps prep program. I'm very uh, excited about today's topic on a side note because I think it's very important to our FIU community. Uh, at FIU, we have many student, uh, student groups who um, plan service trips abroad and do a lot of, uh, a, a lot of good uh, and amazing things abroad, but uh, some of the articles uh, from the New York Times take a lot of different perspectives on service trips abroad, and I think it's very important if we're, if we're going to do things like that at the university to talk about the uh, right and maybe wrong ways to do them and, and all, all, all the different implications of them. So I look forward to talking uh, about this with you and with Andy today. So I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Thanks, Eric. Um, as Eric said, my name is Andy Sullivan, and I am the Peace Corps on-campus recruiter. Um, so the way I was thinking about getting started, have folks had a chance to read Beforehand, raise your hand if you've read already. One person. Okay, cool. So this is what we're going to do. Um, we have five articles here, really. Um, it's actually a debate. I don't know if folks have ever seen this, but the New York, New York Times kind of does these op-ed debates where they get five experts in a topic, um, and each expert writes a short op-ed piece, and they're just kind of comparing and contrasting ideas about a certain topic. Um, so our topic today is, can volunteerism make a difference? Has anybody in here been on a service learning trip? AB, alternative breaks, um, anything like that? Don't be shy, somebody. OK, cool. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about those today. Um, so what I was thinking we could do is we could divide up into five groups. Um, and each group could have, its, uh, have a chance to read through an article and then just provide like a short one or two sentence summary. Um, and that way we could kind of get the debate going. How does that sound? Cool? OK. Um, so if like the six of you right here, from this lady in the checkered hat and this gentleman over to here, um, if you guys want to read the Amy Ernst article, it's called You Can Help But Get Support. The three of you and on over if you guys want to just group up a little bit um, to this woman and, and this gentleman here. Uh, five of you, ex excuse me. Um, you guys want to read uh, Work Hard, Enjoy the Experience, the Chris Johnson article. Um, and do it in a group so that we can then discuss. Um, you five? I'm going to have you read Rafia Zuck. Zacharia's article, Poverty as a Tourist Attraction, ending with you. Um, the four of you right here, if you can read The Problem with a Short-Term Presence, Linda Richter's article. And everybody in the back, if you can group up and read Pippa Biddle's article, Young People Need to Find Real Ways to Help Abroad. Um, and so if you want to do this in a group, I'm going to give you about seven minutes to read the article and then as a group come up with one to two sentences to kind of summarize the article. So sit together maybe if you want to or, or join up so, so you can come up with that, those two sentences together. Okay?
You almost have to defend having fun if you're work if you're doing. So, who wants to present their article first? Which group? So tell us which article you had and kind of a one or two sentence summary of, of what what the general thesis was. So our article was the problem with short term presence. So okay. We talked about how AIDS and HIV really affects these families in, uh, in these lower countries, um, these third world countries, okay. and how it really like tears apart the family. Mm -hmm. And when you volunteer, you're offering only a, a short term solution that may help them in the present, but later on when you leave, their their trust issues get further embellished because they already have lost their family because they're in orphanages, and when you go volunteer, they start to like you, and then you leave, it just happens all So kind of the psychological impacts on orphans, right? Kind of a narrow fo focus on, on one area of development work. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, who's next? Raise your hand. The Amy Ernst article. Oh, uh, yes? Yeah. All right, okay. You can help, but get support. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically we are having here a person who is not affiliated to an international organization, but wants to help in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay. Um, basically what it's telling us here is that this person wants to be active locally but um you have to check you have to verify specifically how you're going to handle a situation because if you don't have support you know you're just going solo on a place that could potentially harm you okay. so you have to check how can it harm you and get support so that wouldn't happen how can it harm you and how so how also maybe to prevent it to avoid it yeah but how about how you could potentially Contribute to the harm, huh? Exactly. Also, yeah. that definitely. Okay. Okay. Cool. The Chris Johnson article. Um. Um. Well, work hard, enjoy the experience. Was written in a very intriguing way, because it was kind of sarcastic. We found, but what the point was trying to be made here is that you know there is ways to volunteer work hard but also have fun and that shouldn't be looked down upon as a bad thing. Basically a lot of people see it as, oh yeah, you just joined the Peace Corps just because you want to have a free ride to Nicaragua or something. So so this isn't about the Peace Corps necessarily. No, this is just a, about... Yeah, um, it's an example. Yeah. It's just about volunteering abroad and the negative, as, the negative ways people look at it. Okay. Cool. And... The Poverty is a Tourist Attraction article. Unless the summarize that. Go ahead. This article focuses on, well, it presents, uh, the article begins by stating how, I guess, Westerners, they undertake vacations as, uh, as a way to get away from their daily lives as a distraction. Okay. And it focuses on the, um, the idea as, um, on this idea of voluntourism. Mm -hmm. And how basically Westerners they take vacations to developing countries to visit orphanages or help build schools, and what the and the author is basically making the point that Westerners they best capitalize on um, they capitalize on um, they basically capitalize on this idea of like trying to find meaning and other communities' pains. So they feel that they're noble people. They feel that they're the saviors of this poor community. And then these, comu these poor communities are then pressured to feel some type of gratitude. Well, mm -hmm. actually, they don't really have to show that gratitude. And so they're basically, uh, the people who come visit these places are using this volunteer, this volunteerism. And the purpose then becomes of making themselves look noble and pressuring the communities to feel gratitude while they <coughs> see that per se. Interesting. So kind of a negative perspective on... Yeah. I mean, they're doing something, but for the wrong purpose. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and finally, in the back there, Philip Diddle's article. 
people need to find real ways to help abroad. And basically, the article basically addresses the idea that when people go on these kinds of foreign trips, they use them as poverty tours rather than using them as ways to make sustainable change in the society. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so we, I'm going to take the seat. Is that okay? <laughs> um, so, uh, so a lot of different perspectives here, huh? Um, so based on these articles, what are some potential benefits that people kind of teased out of, of trips like um, alternative freight trips or service learning trips? What are, what are the benefits? on both sides for the people volunteering and for maybe the communities where they're serving. Darren? Immersing yourself in another culture and also um, learning about customs. OK. For the people volunteering. Yeah. OK. Anybody else? Well, in our article, we talked about how uh, building homes actually makes the prices for homes cheaper. So okay. it does help the society, poor societies in, in the end, making things cheaper or you know more available than they otherwise would be. So scaling something right. brings costs down, and, and so there's benefits for the communities. Right. Okay. It also gives the communities an opportunity to see what the outside, what they, what what happens outside of their own territory, their own countries, their own communities. So it broadens their perspective. Cultural exchange. It's exactly. Okay. On both sides, really. On right? both sides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other positive benefits for communities or for beneficiaries? Maybe it motivates them to keep helping their own community. Mm. Oh, interesting. I like that one a lot. I like that. I like that. Anybody else? Okay. What about adverse impacts? So, uh, what I think is interesting here is, right, like, a lot of people have a very noble heart. They want to do good in the world, right? Um, and and so an alternative break trip, a service learning trip, anything like this is seemingly, there's no negative consequences, right? You're going, you're volunteering your time abroad to help those in need, right? But these articles address some of the negative consequences of, of that service learning. Um, so what could those be? Sometimes we could risk seeming like we're better than them. Okay. That could be a, something that could be we could be perceived as not respecting the cult, the customs, the cultural um, thinking, or the way of doing things in that community, and bringing our ideas and not re respecting that. So kind That's of like that. cultural imperialism. Yeah, because we could, you know, like you know teach them in a way that makes them seem primitive and us being authoritarians or be the authority and something rather than than a true learning experience. Okay. Cool. I think maybe to, to piggyback on that when you talk about advantages and disadvantages, the what I'm thinking could be one and the same in that an advantage is there can be misconceptions maybe from other countries about who Americans are, for example. Yeah. I mean, if we're saying international trips, let's just say Americans, for example, who we are, what we look like, mm -hmm. um, that but we actually do represent diversity, um, you know, an opportunity to learn a little bit more about us and our culture. But then for Americans taking those trips, maybe they have misconceptions about the countries they're going to and they learn something about those people through that experience. But a negative could be um, that if whatever information they're bringing back, if they're going to a part of the developing world where you know, there's extreme poverty or they're really talking about a project that they did, that maybe the, the conception from people who see their pictures or hear their stories, that that's what's going on across the entire country where they visited. Um, or even that you know individuals in that country that's concerned that that's whoever was representing America on that trip is representative of America as a whole. So mm -hmm. it's a fine line. Just to, just to add a little bit more, I remember, I'm from Jamaica, okay. and I remember as a little girl, there would be service groups that would come in and bring 
um, clothes and that, you know household goods for people who were poorer. And we, a lot of times they were used stuff, and that was frowned upon because it's like, you don't think we do? We we buy? You think we use new used stuff? We buy new things. We just can't afford it. Yeah. So it's it, it even though somebody was trying to help. It wasn't received well because it was used a lot of most of it was a lot of yeah, used. Here are leftovers. Exactly. So we people didn't feel valued. Okay. You and then you. Uh, and, and that same aspect can go the opposite way. Sometimes okay. they they receive it as too much, and they take it as for granted. They take it for granted, saying it's going to happen. It's going to come anyway. So these societies, these poor societies, start thinking, okay, there's somebody watching out for me. I don't have to try and work hard. I don't have to try and start buying my own stuff, you know? It can go both ways. Mm -hmm. You know, one can think... So dependency. Yeah, it can turn into dependency or greater independency. I don't want you. I don't want your help. I can do it myself, you know? HIV education. Mm-hmm. So we looked up, and Nicaragua has all this need. There's a huge HIV thing there. So we're like, okay, let's go there. So we went to two rural villages, and when we realized throughout our trip is they don't, they need like it helped them getting HIV awareness, all that stuff. But what they needed was clean water. The whole <laughs> village didn't have clean water, and we're here with condoms and this and stuff. And they they don't have water. They don't have like all this stuff. And we're talking about this, and it really it's. And then, so this year, we thought, let's do something more sustainable. Let's do, like, so we're going to the Dominican Republic this year. We're fundraising uh, for a water filtration system, which can make, and we, we, like, thought this very much through. Like, instead of just going there and then they're going to forget about this, these people that came for a week and talked about mm-hmm. HIV and gave us some stuff and info, but, like, like it did help them, like, the HIV stuff, but right. what they needed is what to live, like, clean water. Right. So. Right. Um, so like, for example, like to make something sustainable, like our article was saying, mm-hmm. like instead of just giving them money to do it, we're getting a thing, a water filtration system, which not only they can use for the kids to get clean water, but they can sell for a low price to people in the community to get books, to get their school mm-hmm. going and things like that to make it a long-term change. Mm-hmm. So that's awesome. Cool. Cool. Interesting. All right. Cool. Um, so, out of the five articles, really only, in, in my perspective, only one is completely positive about it, right? This guy, Chris Johnson, he's saying, it doesn't matter, right? Volunteers go, go abroad. If they want to enjoy themselves while they're there and, and do service learning, um, that's a net positive, no matter what. There's no <laughs> negative impacts. Um, so, say you go build a school abroad, right? Who normally builds schools? Who builds schools in the United States? Government. Government, yeah. right? Government pays for schools, OK. Um, so say you're going abroad and you're building schools. Why, first of all, why are you doing that? Why is there a need? Common perception against uh, amongst many people of like this cosmopolitan idea that we're all humans and we all deserve certain levels of, of life. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, and to obtain that sometimes it's harder for others and for those who have it by virtue of you know it's just a responsibility you should go and help out. Um, okay. So a lot of people do it that way. Other people just do it for to feel some sort of power over others. Okay. But so. You, you got to some of it, but my question is, why isn't there a school there in the first place? Why do you, why does an American need to come over there and buy, build a school? Or what? Either poverty or corruption. Okay, government corruption. So I think this is an inter- interesting point. Uh, so in the United States, governments normally build schools, right? Um, do you think that service learning groups could provide a scapegoat for governments, international governments? Um, to not have to provide the social services that they should be providing? Maybe, right? If people are just going to come volunteer and do this stuff, then the government isn't on the hook for it. Is that 
a potential negative impact? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but the reason why they're going to build the schools is because the customer is not doing it. Mm-hmm. it it's not there. What They're not allocating resources. They can't afford it, or it's not part of the, the political makeup to do that. It's not in their best interest to use their budget for that, because if you keep people ignorant, you control them. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Interesting. Um, so I want to go back to who read the uh, Rafia Zakaria article? Okay. I think this article is really interesting. She's essentially saying that volunteerism um, is net negative, that it's morally <laughs> bankrupt, um, essentially, and that um, it's kind of a Westerner quest for state saviordom. What, what, those of you who read that article, or Eric, what, what do you make of that? Well, <clears throat> I'm saying that I think all, all of the articles are absolutely correct, and it really depends on how the trip is structured and who's mm-hmm. going on, on the trip. Okay. Um, so for Zachariah's article, that doesn't necessarily describe any of the FIU service trips that I've um, either been a part of or been, been aware of, um, in that uh, a lot of FIU service trips involve um, planning the trip and being educated about the, the situation that's causing the problem they're addressing. And, um, and I think that FIU students, being where we're from in mm-hmm. Miami, um, kind of relate more to, to the situations that uh, we're seeing uh, because we're from uh, some of these countries, or our mm-hmm. families are from some of these countries, or even if you're like me and, and, and you're from here, mm-hmm. your entire social circle is, is from some of these countries. Right. And so I, I think there's there's less of a uh, situation than when you're going from Ohio or something mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and you've never experienced anyone who's Hispanic before mm-hmm. or from the Caribbean before or, or you've never known anyone who's lived in the country or you maybe haven't experienced poverty at home when even you know people here it's not just that you know people from the country there's 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 poverty here. so I think that's different um, but I think that we're, we're conscious about about these things but even here there are different levels of it so right. I personally advise two student groups that do service trips abroad and even they're very different one of them has an entire year's worth of curriculum on the social issues and then they're abroad for a full month and then the other one um, really is focused mostly on the fundraising uh, part mm-hmm. and then is there for two weeks. Mm-hmm. And uh, so even though they're both good, and, and even two weeks is a good amount of time because a lot of a lot of alternative break trips are one week, and even mm-hmm. that gives you a lot of time to, 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 to do good things and, 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 and meet the people. Uh, two weeks and four weeks is an entirely different thing. And, and, and so even within just here, uh, it really depends on how you're doing it, and all the articles are correct. Okay. Did somebody have, did you have a response to Zachariah's article or, or an opinion about it? Um, I actually agree with uh, the point that you made basically because and it, it depends on, also like if you look at the authors, I mean the people who wrote them, they also are writing from, I guess, a perspective that they experienced. Um, I like the point that she makes is that how sometimes people go and they volunteer and they treat it more like a vacation. Mm-hmm. So that these communities just be, like for them, they just become another spectacle and like they're just going there to help them for that short of time. But then they return home and they don't really then guess re- like remember about their experiences. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess I like the point that she makes about if you're gonna go assist or volunteer, you should do it with dignity. So don't treat those communities as um, passing spectacles for your vacation per se, but treat them as human beings and don't let them I guess, exploit their pain or their poverty. In that sense, so. I think um, in her in, in this response, I think that she's talking about how people just use it as a momentary time to get away. They make it some sort of image. So you know they're just doing the basics. Oh, let's let's sit next to them and take a picture. Let's play with them, but then once they get away from this vacation or this time off of their lifestyle, they just continue back to their lifestyle and you never hear of them helping again. Sure. So it's kind of like a just momentary 
heroism that they feel themselves, oh, I did such great things mm -hmm. in this one week, and then what, what happens to the rest of it? And it's kind of escapism, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to contrast, was it you that brought up, what if this is the start of you? Yeah, it motivates you, or something like that. Like, Because there are people who do that, who just go for a week. Uh -huh. But you could also have been in, like, there's organizations here that you can help from, from Miami, like UNICEF and UN Women or whatever else. There's different things that you can, in the year, you can, like, help them and make all these differences from just advocating, educating, and do all that stuff from here, even when you come back or before you go. So it doesn't just have to be a week and then that's it. Because volunteerism doesn't just have to be, well, you have to go there. You can make so much difference from here. And it's not only about fundraising, because some problems can't be solved with money, like human trafficking right. can't pay to solve that problem. So. Interesting. So yeah, maybe it opens your eyes up to maybe going on one of these trips, even though the impact that you make while you're there is small or, as, as you suggested, maybe you know, non-existent. Um, There's two sides. Yeah, maybe it opens your eyes to exactly. the idea of volunteering and, and pursuing a career in development or, or, or community service, right? Eric, and then. I think well, one thing, one, one aspect of it, even with our, our, our trips in our community, that plays right into, I think, what she's talking about is social media. And I, I think social media do, does two things. One is it creates an expectation of what you're supposed to say and <laughs> the type of pictures you're supposed to post when you're there. Because anyone going on a trip like this has seen posts of other people on trips like this, and they're always they they they, they seem like life-changing experiences. Oh, you know, I feel the the, the, the community is so great. I'm you know I'm friends with all the kids. So if you see the friends with all the kids picture. That, that people before you have posted, you feel compelled when you get there to have a, um, a friend with all the kids uh, picture, and, and you're going to focus in on, even though that probably does happen naturally in most cases, you're probably trying to make sure that it happens, whether or not it would have happened uh, naturally. Um, and then, you know, it does, uh, you know, I'll just leave it at my favorite, one of my favorite, The Onion headlines. The Onion, if you're not familiar with the satirical news uh, site, uh, you're, you're missing out. And, and one of the best headlines that I ever saw on The Onion, um, because it really makes you think about this, is, um, you know, uh, uh, spring break service trip completely changes college students' profile picture. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'll just leave it at that. It's a, it's a funny article. I haven't heard from this site in a while. Let's say you... Anybody? Um, well, I, after everybody's comment, I, I too agree with what's being said as far as like it can change somebody's, right. you know, mind. Like they're, go, they may go with the wrong mindset and come back with the right. So it can be an eye opener, but you know, it's definitely something to be treated. That's it's a very serious thing. So I don't know. So yeah, it can change somebody's yeah. mindset mm -hmm. on the one hand, right? But let's go. What about this article by uh, Linda Richter? At what cost, right? She really um, talks about the psychological um, damage that can be that can be a negative impact of these short-term trips, right? Um, and and short-term volunteer opportunities, right? People, volunteers coming and going, um, the, the kind of attachment issues. Um, so it's just one very specific example of a type of volunteer trip. But but so that's the cost, right? So at what cost, right? It opens somebody's eyes, but this is an example of, of some damage that could be imparted um, as a result. So is it worth it? Absolutely, because you know, people here I think are too comfortable and too caught up in their materialistic world. So when they see something that maybe they don't really want to pay attention to, um, and it does open their eyes, you know, I feel that that really is for the better because this is what's happening in the world, and people need to be connected and informed in order to give positive help and encouragement or whatever is necessary. So I think it's good for them to experience something that's actually real and happening. Okay. I just wanted to mention piggybacking on the young lady in the back. Mm -hmm. She said that she, they went, she went into that country 
with the AIDS initiative in mind and discovered what the real need was. Okay. So you might have an intention when you leave of what you think they need, but you don't really know until you really get there to see beyond what's on the surface. And that's a good thing. Interesting. That's a, yeah. that's a very no, I, good I, thing. I thought that was a good point. This time that when we asked the school, like, what do you need most? So you learn. They gave us a letter saying, like, this is the report from our water when the government came and checked the water. And it was like, it has feces in it, this and that. So it was like... So what they really needed was a way to make the water that they do have it cleaner, so uh, water filtration. Beautiful. Is awesome. Cool. All right. So with all this in mind, let's. Um, Where do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, now let's continue the discussion a little bit, and then uh, and then you know if, if there's some time to talk about the piece at the end, I, I love doing that. Um, but uh, so. If we were to design a volunteer trip abroad in this room, what types of things might we keep in mind when we were doing that in order to make it effective, to make it sustainable, to make sure that the impact that we were having, that we didn't have any negative impact? I, I really like what um, er Amy Ernst says, right? She kind of um, tried to operate under the Hippocratic Oath, right? The, the, the oath that all doctors take when they become a, a doctor, do no harm, right? Um, so what types of things might we keep in mind? You, as somebody who's worked on these trips and kind of designed these trips, you know, what do you try and keep in mind? I want to make the most impact that I can make, so I try to use my expertise. So I want to be an educator, so the, I, I did another trip, not with AB, with Isaac, which are longer like minimum six weeks. So mm -hmm. I went two months to do a teaching internship. To, I can teach English, so I taught English. Another time I taught about global issues and things like that. So if you're an environmental, that's your major or whatever, go help make a plan with these organizations, do things like, do things that maybe that's your, whatever your degree is, is if you're- So, so use your skills. Use then. your skills. Mm -hmm. Okay, something like all right. That. But one thing is that we, those who are just going to go out for, to these trips for a vacation, and those who are actually going to put work into it, is the interests of the people. So, like you said, if you right. put, if you make it to their interests, I'm going because I can put this on my resume. I'm going because I can do this to, you know, better so myself. So some sort of mutual benefit right. or synergy, right? right. right. Besides right. just the oh, you get a chance to travel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you but make it. It's not. It's not just about travel. Too. It's also like. Like, if you can, I learned just as much from them as they learned from me, I feel like. Like, I went to, like, I'm not a Spanish speaker, and I went to Colombia with knowing hola and gracias, and then <laughs> I came back, on, like, way more, and the second time I went to a Hispanic country, way more Spanish, and also, like, learning from their experiences and things like that. We can, we can both help each other. Like, but if you're going this, like, I want to go to Peru, I want to see Machu Picchu, and that's right, why you want to go through this trip, that's weed, not, yeah. It's a weed. The bad from the good. You try to you, you want to put something in front of them, like dangle a little carrot in front of them, because that's the thing that's gonna make them go the extra mile. That's gonna separate the people who want to go just for, you know, shits and giggles, and those who want to go for a real purpose. But and even if the real purpose doesn't really matter per se to what you're trying, to what the organization is trying to achieve, it matters to them in that aspect of. It betters me. I think that's me. I think that's interesting too. I think I think some sort of symbiotic relationship is necessary, right? I don't think it's wrong to volunteer because it's going to benefit you in some certain way, right? I don't think that's wrong. It's less idealistic, but I don't think it's it's not morally uh, corrupt. Combining both their ideas and you find a perfect solution, which would be those who go on the trip show active interest, so they begin to workshop seeing how they attack the problem, how they learn about the problem, they inform themselves, and then based off of their interests and their activities within the learning session, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we see who can actually go on this trip instead of it just being, oh, just pay your money, and then you can go. Instead, it'd be a, a over time process yeah, of yeah. learning. I don't like that. Yeah. So based on research, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Research okay. Matt? I think sometimes the, we're almost, in a way, separating an, an easy divide between good volunteers and, and bad volunteers. I think sometimes the greatest of intentions can have negative effects that we don't foresee. And I hear us talking about both, 
volunteering and service learning, and I think there's a big difference between the two. Um, so I, I think I think that's important to keep in mind if you're looking for those experiences. If you have the opportunity to be involved and have a service learning trip, that's very different. And I think what what differentiates the two on an international level is there has to be some education beforehand incorporating local knowledge um, and having that really paying attention to cultural sensitivity and understanding what could be misconstrued when you're on these trips um, and what kind of an impact you're hoping to make and that it's it's a shared it's a shared impact um, and that you have the local voice um, as, as part of that trip. It's not just you going out there blindly organizing a trip that you think is going to be beneficial. It, it comes from an area of need that's been identified from whatever that community or country is. Cool. So, so some kind of ownership on the part of the community. I think that like if we're trying to organize a, a, a sort of a trip, mm -hmm. I think it should be some sort of reconnaissance trip before. You know what I mean, like a trip of people who have already done this before, people who mm -hmm. know how to identify problems and know how to communicate with people with the same language and stuff like that. You send them first, maybe three or four, um, to whichever area you want to go to, and then so the issue that happened to her with the HIV doesn't necessarily happen. You don't waste that trip because somebody's going in there beforehand, evaluating the circumstances, seeing what needs to be done. And then when they come back, you know, with the education thing that you were saying, you can actually educate the people who are going better with that and have these things on hand and, you know, with pictures, video, whatever it may be, to better educate those who are going to do the work. You know? But we got to put some responsibility on the community themselves. Like we're not just the only people who can find the problems. They know their problems too. So they can right. tell yeah, us right. what they need. Like instead of us just going there and be like, I think this is wrong. Yeah. To, like no, to yeah, it be the, be the, the yeah. all seeing eye that can do that. So I actually think this is a good segue, um, if you'll permit me, to talk a little bit about how the Peace Corps approaches some of these issues. Um, and um, the Peace Corps is really distinct from a service learning trip, right? Um, because it's a much longer commitment, obviously. It's a two-year commitment as opposed to a week or, or two-week commitment or even a six-week commitment. Um, so one of the things that they do, first and foremost, is every single Peace Corps um, organization abroad, every single country that hosts Peace Corps has a uh, relationship with the government. They've been invited by that host country's government to be there in the first place, right? Um, so the Peace Corps hasn't gone there and petitioned them and say, let us in. The government has invited the Peace Corps to come work there, number one. Um, and then every volunteer in addition to that um, is also <coughs> solicited by a community where they're going to live, right? And the way that this works, I can tell you because I, I did this, I had this job um, as a Peace Corps volunteer um, leader in my, in my third year, is Peace Corps does what's called site development trips in the country. And they go out to communities that have written an application for a Peace Corps volunteer and they say, um, they say, you know, all right, this is what the Peace Corps does. This is what you're looking for. Where do those paths kind of cross? And if there's enough intersection on that Venn diagram, right, um, then a Peace Corps volunteer would go there, right? Um, so kind of that solicitation aspect. Um, some other things that we talked about, training, right? So Peace Corps only sends people with college degrees, mostly. Um, and if they don't have a college degree, they have a lot of expertise in a certain area, right? Um, so we make sure that all of our volunteers have kind of uh, some sort of expertise in there now. Um, other things? Any other questions about that? I'll throw something out here as well. Oh. Um, I'm also a return Peace Corps volunteer. That's how Andy and I met. Um, and I, I think when you, when you talk about site development, mm -hmm. an important thing is that even though Peace Corps is a federal agency, so it represents America, a majority of staff for Peace Corps abroad is host country nationals, so individuals that are from those countries and are really in tune um, with, with the culture and the language and, and the understanding for the needs. So those conversations aren't, um, I'm an American coming in, and, and what are your problems? Let's see if we can fix it. It's already coming from a place of understanding before those conversations even happen. 
and most people ask the question, we were even kind of talking here, I mean, Peace Corps, why does it have to be two and a half years, right? It's such a long <laughs> amount of time, it's a really big time commitment. It's because, you know, Peace Corps, I think, understands based on their experience that it would be very ineffective if you were trying to do something sustainable to come in and hit the ground running, right? As an American with your uh, preconceived ideas of how you're gonna come in this concept of heroism or saviordom, uh, that that first year is really intended for getting to know yeah. the community and feeling like you're a part of it, to understand, to build relationships, and then once you realize what your community has expressed to you that they can use some support with, um, then that second year is really utilized towards towards meeting those goals. Yep. I would agree with all those things. Well, let, let me ask this question. Can a short-term trip be sustainable? I guess it depends on um, what they're doing. Like, okay. they're, yeah. like one of the articles mentioned about <coughs> helping children uh -huh. and how they have a tendency to want that intimacy uh -huh. with the volunteer. So if it's if it has something to do with like building something, I'll see a problem with the short term. But if it's something with children, then okay, I can give you an example of a problem with the short term of building something. You want to hear it? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so in my community, where I live, is a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, a year before I arrived, a development organization from the Netherlands had visited, um, and it was a it was a service learning group. They were there for about two or three weeks, and they built an aqueduct um, for my community. And so, for the first time ever, my community had running water um, on tap stands um, outside of their homes, and a couple people had the, the water inside their home, but but most of them just had like a spigot outside. Mm -hmm. Before that, every single community member had to pay 25 pesos, so about 50, 50 cents for one five gallon bucket of water, right? They would, they would pay like a, a kid to go down to the river and, and fetch this bu bucket of water. And then all of a sudden they had running water, okay? So the development organization had some good intentions and had an idea about how to leave a sustainable structure to maintain this aqueduct, right? Because an aqueduct isn't going to maintain itself, exactly. right? It's tubing. It's it's a technical piece of engineering. Um, it can break. Mm -hmm. um, so my host brother, actually, in my community, was um, the person who was in charge of maintaining this aqueduct. And the way that they had set up the they had a water committee, right, within the community. And the deal was that everybody had to pay a monthly fee of 40 pesos maintain the aqueduct. And my host brother was in charge of collecting that money um, and then also maintaining the aqueduct, okay? So now the water is here. It's been built by this organization and my host brother goes to collect that money and people don't want to pay it, okay? And then the aqueduct starts, starts breaking. And who pays for the aqueduct? Sounds like you go, they go back to square one. No running water. And it's crazy, right? They were paying 25 pesos for a bucket of water. Now they have running water, but nobody wants to pay for this. Why? Because they got it free first? I don't know. Maybe. But then also, what happens if you cut off your if you if you don't pay for your water in the states? What happens? You won't have water. It gets cut off, right? So because this aqueduct was built um, within the community by. Uh, uh, an independent organization, a nonprofit organization, the only way that water would get cut off is, is uh, was if my host brother cut it off, right? And he would literally have to cut the tubes. So the Dominican Republic's a pretty collectivist culture, right? Yeah. And you grow up in a community with 100 homes, um, and you know everybody that you live with. If somebody doesn't pay for their water, are you going to go to their house and cut the tubes? They cut your legs. <laughs> They're also your friends and your family, yeah. too, right? Yeah. How are you going to deny them water? So it's it's this, like, cute, it's this, what's the solution? I, don't, I, don't, I mean, it, this was still going on after I left. I had no solution for it. I had no idea what to do. What kind of legwork did this NGO do before they ever got there in terms of asking the local council and they worked for that idea? Mm -hmm. Not enough, apparently. <laughs> Not enough. So what what could potentially happen is that the two breaks down and they and then nobody over has time, water over time and then nobody has water because that's 
Yeah. What happened if it's that service? And, and, and the aqueduct required routine maintenance, right? So this fee was also just like for my host brother. He had to hike five miles up to the, the source to like clean out the tubes if it got clogged. Um, but he never stopped doing it. So they didn't have to it. pay. They didn't have to suffer a consequence. Yeah. Because he needed water too. Exactly. <laughs> So, so that's an example, right? That's an example. Not, not, not all of them are. Yeah. are. Couldn't you set up someone from the community to learn how to do this right. maintenance, and that way? Well, he did. He was set up. He knew how to do this maintenance. But they just but didn't want to pay. But tubing costs money. Is he going to pay for it out of his own pocket? Is that his responsibility? And the host brother is like from. Yeah, he lives there. He lives there. He lives, there. He lives like in the community from there. So did they try to find out from the community why they wouldn't pay? Did, did, was there like a town hall meeting or something oh, like that? Oh, they had meetings all the time about it. They had meetings all the time about it. What did they say? I mean, what's the point? They kept threatening to cut off water, but then they wouldn't actually do it. Well, that's a problem. If I tell my kids I'm going to beat them or give them a consequence and I don't do yeah. it, they laugh at me. <laughs> Same thing. That's, a, that's the problem. That that's there the, wasn't any That's the problem because there's no consequence. Because yeah. he should just shut that mother down for <laughs> a little bit and go with a, his water too and see what, how they respond. Somebody might want to come to pay or they might chase him out of town. But you'd find out. Yeah, you, you have to make people be responsible for what they're responsible for. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know the solution for it. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, could, my, my host dad would ask me all the time, what should we do about this, Andy? Like, and I really, I didn't have an answer for him. I felt terrible about it. Um, but because the, in the eyes of the community, or in some people's eyes, the, that water committee didn't have any legitimacy, even though it had all been decided upon by the community, um, you know, they, they couldn't, they couldn't force people to pay. I don't know. That's, and, and, and so the flip side, to go back to my earlier point, right? Like, if the government had installed that aqueduct mm -hmm. and people weren't paying for water service, they the government, as a third party actor, could easily come in and cut off the water. Right. So maybe in the future, they might want to have a third party in on the deal for that same reason. But how? how? How does that? How do you implement that? I don't know. Yeah. So have more, more, more ideas. Maybe, yeah. maybe if they plan more and like they have one giant, like what we're doing with our project, we're having like uh, we're installing like a room kind of thing, which can make a whole bunch of water mm -hmm. in like a certain amount of time. And then to get it, you have to pay, and then they give you in the whatever container the water. So like if they didn't pay, why we can't give you? It costs money. Yeah, they already had access, so it's they should think about that yeah. beforehand. But it wasn't free. It was established that it wasn't going to be free. It was established when they started the project that everybody was but going to have to pay 40 pesos. What's going to happen if someone doesn't pay? Did they they pay? did establish it, but then that, that did they have a there way wasn't to stop one, like maybe some sort of system like that? They didn't establish that right. thing. They didn't find that far ahead. I mean, they did establish it. They just didn't follow through on it. They didn't cut off the That's water. That's the problem. Yeah. They follow through. Maybe. Maybe. And somebody keeps servicing it. It's mm -hmm. not just that they didn't cut it off because people didn't pay. Somebody has to maintain it. So if you continue to maintain it, they're getting clean water. It's like if I don't pay my light bill and, and FPNL doesn't come and cut it off and they only send me threatening notices, why should I pay? I still have service. You have no incentive to. Right. You have to create incentives. Absolutely. And trust me, when 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 the stuff hits the fan and affects you directly, you change your mind real quickly. Okay. Well, all a lot of interesting points. Um, <laughs> I really like this topic. If you want to talk more about it, I'm on campus three days a week from Tuesday through Thursday. Um, I'm in GC 230. You can just ask Grace, our receptionist, for me. I'm back there. Um, if I'm not there, I'm probably talking to a class or something. Um, but I do want to invite, if anybody's interested in Peace Corps and wants to learn more about the application process, um, I do have a, an info session about that tonight. It's, called, it's an application workshop. It's actually here also in this building um, in room 316 upstairs. Um, it's at 530. And we're 
So it's not really a general info session about Peace Corps. It's more about um, the ins and outs of the application process. Okay. Um, so if you have questions about that, it would be good to. If you have questions about Peace Corps, I would like to say. Shoot me an email, or we can set up a time to um, to just chat in my office. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Renee. <laughs>